that is that communication is a skill. Amen? It's something that we develop. I'm sure many of you have had a course, maybe at work, or maybe you've taken college courses on communication. How do you effectively get your message across, whether it's to a large audience or interpersonal relations? Because communication is your words. It's also your body language, isn't it? It's your expressions. It's the mood and the tenor with which you speak. All of those are helpful or they can hinder your message. It's how you say what you say. Even your proximity to a person can change the effectiveness of that message. And being able to have that message relayed back. Did you really understand what I was saying? Did I communicate it with you in such a way that you receive the message without this big word, cognitive dissonance, right? Something got in the way of you really getting the message. It was outside of me. I want you to think about that with God. We're going to be studying uh, a little bit from James chapter 4. We'll get to our text in Luke chapter 11, which is a summation of Jesus telling the apostles he's going to teach them how to pray. And here in the book of James, I want us to think about firstly that the efficacy of prayer as it relates to communication with God begins with the right conditions. What are the conditions of prayer? And how do those conditions affect the message? Because, again, we are not living in the miraculous age any longer under which we can receive a direct message to know that God heard what I said and that he's going to communicate back to me in such a way that I understand it, right? You know, if you're talking to your children and you ask them something and they seem kind of funny about it, <laughs> you want to say, oh, did you really understand? Let me give you a chance. Did you really understand what I was saying? And they'll either tell you yes, and you can pick up on their feedback. But when it comes to pouring out our hearts to God, there is no direct feedback. We believe, according to the consistency of Bible teaching, there is an answer. It's either going to be yes or no or wait a while. But who knows when I'm going to really get that answer. It's not going to come directly, certainly. And most of the time, it doesn't even come indirectly. But what I do want you to see is this. When we pray to God, it's not to help God out. Amen. <laughs> it, the, in, the necessity or the incessity, we are praying incessantly. God help me. God help me. God help me. All of those things, that effort and sincerity is for me, not God. Because God knows what I need even before I ask. And that's a beautiful thing. That God knows me from within in such a way that cognitively and emotionally, and spiritually, God knows exactly where I am. But yet and still, he commands me to communicate with him. He wants me to pour out my requests. He wants me to beseech him, to make supplications. That's requests on behalf of brothers and sisters, the needs of others. So let's begin here in James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives more grace, therefore, he says, God resists the proud, resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If God gives grace, and I believe he does, then certainly it's consistent that I'm going to have an appreciation for that grace. In essence, my faith and belief in God is demonstrated by the words with which I speak to God with simplicity and with reverence. And that's key. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36, down about verse 38, when Elijah is praying to God, after this whole day that the prophets of Baal have been wailing and cutting themselves and doing everything they possibly can to call upon Baal to do something, Elijah says a very simple and reverent prayer. God, let your power be known. This day, show your power. That's all. And with that, everything was done. The fire came down from heaven. It consumed the soaked altar and the ground beneath it. His power was made known and evident in an instant. More evident than a whole day's full of wailing and pleading. And so understand this. Humbling ourselves, first of all, is not degrading ourselves. Don't confuse that. The Bible uses humility often, and sometimes it gets pushed into that category of, well, if I tear myself down, that's humiliation. 
and that's different. Humility, according to the Bible's idea of it, is when I look to someone else and I emphasize what's good in you and I focus there. In this case, who is the emphasis of goodness being placed upon is not upon the one who's bound before the throne. It's the one who's on the throne, God Almighty. Amen. God Almighty is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our utmost respect from the heart. And so I'm lowering myself, not just in a physical sense. It's wonderful to get down on your knees in prayer. It's something about what happens when I'm down on my knees that changes my perspective. Can God hear my prayer when I'm standing? Certainly. But the perspective that I have is different. When my face is planted in the floor, I am looking deep within myself and really considering what I'm making these requests to God for and about. He says he gives grace to the proud, but he resists the haughty and arrogant attitude that I'm going to be expecting of anything. God does not even hear those things or nor acknowledge them at least. That's implied. I need to be careful that I go to God with serious reference and respect. Because many people believe in prayer, amen, but they don't dare do it, except when I'm in trouble. And that is to negate all the sin in my life, all the ugliness. I'm going to put that in some little box, and then I'm going to come over here and say, God, help me. But I have no intention of getting rid of the sin. That's not humility. Humility is sincere. Humility is that sense within myself, I'm going to put everything aside and give everything to God. So submission here and humility is not about God is going to keep these things from me. Let's keep reading and see how James explains it. So he says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will free from you. So here's the conditions. Submitting to God is more than just bowing my head and closing my eyes. I pray a lot of time while I'm driving, and I certainly don't close my eyes, amen. <laughs> don't you do that either. I'm going to be worried about you. But from the sincerest place in my heart, I'm speaking to God. And as I speak to him, I'm acknowledging that every word I say has something attached to it. My responsibility to let go. That's the trust that I have in God. That's why I don't have to have an answer. See, the world says, well, just pray about it, and God will show you the way. Or you know what? These things are happening in your life, and their problems, and their struggles. We're confused, brethren, in our world. See, our nation, our world likes to see itself as very kind and very loving. But we are very hypocritical when it comes to forgiveness. <laughs> we are so inconsistent with that. And you know why that is? It's because we look to some answer, right? Because I look to an answer in prayer, a yes or a no, or God's going to tell me something, and I don't get it. I don't bother with prayer anymore. See, I can still say I believe in prayer. I'm just not going to bother with it. I'm not going to put any effort toward it because I don't see that it makes a difference. And that's the exact opposite of what James is calling us to for the efficacy of a true prayer, right? The affectious prayer, that's where that term efficacy comes from, of a righteous man availeth much. What we're able to accomplish down on our knees is, you know, 10 in magnitude compared to the labor and the work that we might do physically. Because I can help one person that needs to hear the gospel and teach them the truth and they might obey it, but I can pray for a whole nation. Now, who will that affect? How many generations? But I need the perspective of I'm not going to tell God what to do, nor am I leaving it only when God gives me the answer I want. See that? That's not effective communication. I'll only talk to you when you tell me what I want to hear. How many people are you going to talk to like that? And you know some people like that, I'm sure. But the reality is with God, we don't have this type of, of understanding. And it's sad that the world strays away from this because it has nothing to do with changing my conditions. Prayer is so much about 
how God communicates with me. And here's the beauty of it. Here's, here's what's powerful about the right conditions of it. When I do humble myself, when I do submit to his will, and I let go saying, well, Lord, and I don't know what's going to happen here, but I'm putting it in your hands. That's when his power becomes known. That's when I'm at peace. That's when I'm in this place. But with those conditions, secondly, there's also cooperation, right? Now, we already circled back to talk about that. We're not in a miraculous age, so we're not doing anything to force God's hand. But cooperation means there is something that God requires of me to do in relationship to that prayer. I make these requests to God, but what is required of me is to get rid of the sin in my life. I can't go to God and pray that I'm not going to bicker and fight and have bitterness in my heart if I'm not going to use kind words. Okay. If I'm not going to be patient. If I'm not going to be easy to forgive and pleasant in my attitude. I am in control of those things. And God understands and knows that. But what's going to change? When I'm in that moment and someone has, has done something hurtful to me, and I can lash out, I can retaliate, and I feel this anger in me, and, and I submit to you this. This is not part of my sermon, but I want you to hear this. What do I do with that anger? What do I do with it? How do I handle it? I submit to you that God wants us to let that anger fertilize growth. That anger is an opportunity for us to get in touch with our relationship with God when we sin. That anger is something that filters and grows in my heart to remind me I was at a distance from God and in sin. And it's only because of the love of Christ and his cleansing blood that I even get to communicate with the Almighty. I treated God the same way. Well, that person's been so mean to me. I treated God that way. Well, that person is so selfish. Oh, yeah, I did that to God. Well, that person only thinks about what they're going to get out of Oh, yeah, I did that too. I'm not saying that it doesn't change how you feel when you're angry. The hurt, the pain. But you watch the Oscars, didn't you? You see what happens when a person takes their anger and they just let it out. It's never good. And what might have felt good in the, in the instance of the moment was immediately gone. And that's why God says, bless and pray for those who despitefully use you. That's right. Because I know better. And really, is that what you would teach a two-year-old? Someone took my candy. Okay, you go smack them as hard as you can. That's going to really make it better. No, it's going to make you feel terrible. And God understands that. So the cooperation on my part when it comes to prayer is to remember, if you want to be close, this is what we're talking about, devotion to God. I want to have a relationship to God that is real based on the truth, not based on I'm trying to figure out God's will for my life. It's really about can I communicate with you? You know when your spouse is being kind and nice and when they're being selfish or when they're kind of manipulating you. Even when they're being nice about it, you can see it. How do you think that God that knows us from the inside out knows when my motives are questionable? So when I submit to God, and when I remove myself from those things that will keep me from being in that right relationship, what I'm saying to God is, I want to be close to you. When we read in the scripture, we're reading about people who were close to God. When we read about David, a man after God's own heart, at that time, at that time, when David was his strongest, David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Amen. David knew something. If I have the scripture in my heart, I'm not going to say an angry word. I'm not going to be selfish. I am going to be forgiven because I'm thinking I'm a Christian. That's how I think. Don't say that. Don't think that. Don't, don't react that way. You're a Christian. God would not want you to, to think that way. Be kind. Be patient. Be forgiven. Let that go. 
All of those things don't come naturally. And they're only communicated when someone sees that. Because if someone's being nice to you just because they want something, you can see right through that. But when they genuinely are being nice and compassionate and considerate from an honest place, it means so much, isn't it? It means so much. This idea with cleansing your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, is a part of this. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. It's just a chapter over. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning verse 22. This is how this looks in action. If I'm going to cleanse my hand and purify my heart, he says, see, you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. As long as the word is alive and abiding in you, it's making a difference you are going to act in such a way that you've been purified. You are a secondborn in a world of firstborns. Amen. There is something different between you and your neighbor. If you're a Christian, you've been baptized into Christ, you've been born again. They have not. Their focus and their mindset and their thinking is controlled and focused on something totally different than when you have given your life over to Christ. There's a cooperation there. And it means something when I communicate with the God of heaven and he knows I'm doing everything in my power to avoid sin. Yes, there's freedom in Christ, but not as an occasion to sin. Remember Paul describes it this way in Galatians chapter 4 when he says we cry out, Abba, Father. And that word, that's one of the very few, I think there's two or three, possibly just two in the whole New Testament that are in Greek. That's an Aramaic word. It's a word that the Greek-speaking Gentiles in Galatia, Galatia understood. It's a, it's, it's a word of affection. Not that we would refer to God as Papa, but it's similar to that. It's as a child refers lovingly to their parent. We have that kind of relationship with God because we love him. And that's good. That's strong. And it's important because it makes me know that God is there. And we have that in our everyday life, don't we? Right? See, I can say to my wife, baby, would you go and get that for me? She'll say, oh, no problem. But if another man comes up and says to my wife, baby, go get this, we're going to have an issue. <laughs> you don't know my wife that way. That's a sign of intimate communication that you don't have the authority or privilege to be a part of. And so when we have that kind of relationship to God, it's because we have done those things. We have shown ourselves to be faithful to him. That's where we cleanse our hands. That's where we purify our hearts. And that's our cooperation. That's what we're doing so that God recognizes where we are spiritually. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we'll begin reading at verse 16. These conditions aren't easy. They're a challenge. I uh, submit that to you. It's not easy constantly thinking that I'm going to show the kind of love that Jesus showed. Because that's what 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, right? Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Yet, are you at that point in your love yet? You always give the person the benefit of the doubt, your spouse, your husband, I mean your Parent, your children, your neighbor, your coworker, you always are loving them with that kind of agape love, even when they're ugly and hurtful, even when they get on your nerves, even when they are impatient with you, even when they're disloyal and hurtful. That's the kind of love, and that takes effort. Thus, we pray about it. <laughs> we pray about it. We're asking for God to help us to be mindful of these things. And we see it demonstrated here. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Got the wrong verse. That's chapter 5 I want, I want, or the end of chapter 4. Chapter 4 or chapter 3, excuse me. I'm all over the place. Here we go. 1 Thessalonians toward the end of the chapter. Let's go to chapter 3 first. Then we'll get to where we're going. 
were demonstrating that this kind of love that they had one to another as brethren is important. First Thessalonians chapter 3, let's start in verse 8. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 8. For now we live if you stand last in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you for all the joy with which ye rejoice for your sake before our God night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. God wants us to live in such a way that we can perfect what's lacking in the faith of our brethren. In other words, if I'm more forgiven, what are you more likely to do? Be forgiven. If I'm more patient with you, what are you more often not going to do? You're going to respond with patience. And if I see you doing that first, what am I going to feel? I'm going to feel indebted, right? I'm going to feel like I need to reciprocate that because you set such a good example before me. It's crucial that we understand that prayer and the efficacy of it is based on this relationship that I cooperate in. Because the more I do it, you know what it tends to, to lead me to? An attitude and a heart where I want to be closer to God. I, I want to understand that relationship in such a way that not only am I closer to him because of the feeling, the emotion, I'm also closer to him because of what I understand about that relationship. Thirdly, it's the comfort of prayer. There is a comfort. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, if you want to turn there, or if you're taking notes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. We have a glory and joy because the Almighty God is here with us in this room. Amen. We are here to worship him, and we're communing with him. It's not as if God has come down from heaven to this pulpit and podium, and then I'm going to be the conduit to God. No, God is there every place that there is a soul in this building. Because Peter says that we are together as spiritual stones, built up as a spiritual house. How many houses can you have built with one stone? Have one big stone, that's where I'm going to live. No, that's the pastor model of, of man-made religions. In this model, the comfort we have is, I am a minister. I am a minister. How many members do you have? We got 80 members, we got 80 ministers. We got 80 priests and priestesses who have the authority to go to God's throne, and they have the comfort of knowing God is there. Because what James says is beautiful. Think of the imagery. Let's go back to four, chapter 4. The comfort of this, that the Christian is left with. Here is the God who has created all things. The great one above. And here is the picture of what happens when we submit ourselves. He says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Think about two aspects of this comfort. The first one is, is that God is coming to me. You know, as a child, even as a young Christian, I used to think about my prayers are going up to God. I was really just so focused about I had to be in this place, this place to go to God. You remember, or you maybe you heard about that movie, The War Room? And it was about the main character. She had this room and she'd go in to pray and she had a chart on the wall and it was all the things she was praying about. And her, it was a, the imagery of a battle against the world and, and God was her source of power. And I'm not saying that's the wrong imagery, but for me, I want my relationship and communion with God to be a place of love. I want that to be a place of joy and beauty and peace. That's what God is. Yes, we are in a battle with Satan, don't get me wrong, but I get more strength from the love, affection, and care of God. That's the imagery. And so God wants us also to see that that communication we have is God coming down and meeting us in prayer. He is coming down from heaven. Why? Because I'm so worthy? No, because of his grace and his mercy. 
Now, you know why I don't have that comfort at times? It's because of sin in my life. When I have sin in my life, I feel so far away from God. Amen. When you've done something wrong, you don't want to go to your wife and tell her. <laughs> right? You hope she don't find out. Or vice versa, amen. Because you just, even if it's something small, you don't want that uncomfortableness. You don't want that awkwardness. If it's a best friend, you don't want to text them and say, oh, yeah, I didn't do that. Or, yeah, I told you I was going to do that. Or, you know, you asked me to do that, and I really said I, I was busy, but I wasn't. It feels awkward, doesn't it? But if you're a good friend, you'll tell them the truth and be honest. And if they're a good friend to you, they'll understand. And the feeling you have, the, that sense of reconciliation is beautiful. That's the comfort that when we are hurting and we know we've done wrong, that's when we want to come to God. And we have to overcome that mentally. Remember in Psalm 51, what did David say? Create in me what kind of heart? A clean heart. Let me be like you. Because, God, you're 100% pure. So how can me with this filth of my guilt and shame, and I know I've done wrong, and it wasn't an accident, I willingly did it, and now I have to come to you again to ask for forgiveness. That's not an attractive scenario, even for the most faithful Christian. But God says, draw nigh to me. And I will draw nigh to you. And he didn't say, only do it when you haven't sinned. Only do it when you're not coming to me for forgiveness. Only do it when you're not repenting. He says, draw nigh to me. See, the efficacy of prayer is the communication. That communication with God only stops when I break it. And that's what happens with sin. Over time, more sin causes more pain. Amen? But why do we... Why do we not realize that in the moment? Do you realize that more Christians have the attitude or tendency that when we sin, we do more sin? I submit to you it's the part that James is talking about here. Resist the devil. Because, see, the devil says, I'm here for you. You're hurting. You've sinned. And God is not going to be happy about it. Now, he's lying. But in that moment of pain, sometimes we listen, right? And God says, I'm offering, I mean, the devil says, I'm offering you this. And if you take this, you're going to feel better instantaneously. I promise you, you'll feel better. And you do another sin. And you do feel better. And instantaneously, it's over. And then you need another sin. And another sin. It's just like an addiction. You get caught in an endless cycle that is a downward spiral because I won't come to terms with the fact that God loves me in whatever condition I'm in, my part is to go to God. Because if I don't go to God, I'm going to get so far away from him that I forget how to come back. And you know what else? I'm not going to want to come back. I'm not sure who said it, but the worst condition for the Christian soul to be in is You've lost the direction of God and the desire. I don't know how to go back, and I don't even want to. That's what the devil offers. But drawing now to God, God says, I'm going to draw now to you. And the second part of that is God's protection. I'm coming, in a sense, to protect you from all of that. I know what happens to human beings when they don't face up to their pain. It eats and festers at you from the inside out. That's what God is saying. And prayer is the way that you can pour it out to me and you can be free from it. That was the whole purpose of the Son of God. Remember in the Old Testament when they offered sacrifices? When did they offer sacrifice? Go back and read Leviticus 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. It's all about the sacrifices. They offer them when they sin. Now, there were sins of consecration to be committed to God, but the bulk of the the sacrifices were when they sinned. Now, tell me, when did Jesus sin and he had to go offer sacrifice? He was innocent. He is the sacrifice for my sin. And because of that, I don't ever have to feel ashamed to go to God if I do it sincerely and according to his word as he has commanded, then we're communicating. And God can be there, and he can help me, and he can soothe me and comfort me in my trouble, in my distress, in my issue. 
because you know what we need? We need someone to listen. That's when God is that Abba Father. He's the one I can lean on. He's the one I can go to. And in that place, it's not a war. It's beautiful. Because God doesn't hold a whip. He's not holding something to punish me. He's got his arms wide open to put his arms around me and comfort me because he knows I'm hurting. That's hard, brethren. It's hard for us to think of that because we think in terms of I'm just not worthy of that. I just don't feel like God is going to do that. You know what else? I don't feel like God should do that. I deserve to be punished. But it's the wrong mindset. God wants us to think in these terms and see that that's a comfort. All right, lastly this, verse 9, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. The implication of this is when we humble ourselves, when we lower ourselves, God gives us the power. It's letting go. But when we lift ourselves up, that's the arrogant, haughty, prideful spirit. And sometimes it works this way. It's not that we're arrogant to God. It's just we want to get everything right first, then go to God. But see, isn't that trying to help God out? (laughs) Isn't that changing the dynamic of his grace and mercy? Because it becomes something that's not because we're not worthy, but because we are worthy. Because, God, I've got it all together. I swept it up. I cleaned it up. Look at this image. It's so much nicer than before. I'm sure this will please you. I, I, I. That's the problem. If we humble ourselves, God will be the one to clean us up. He'll be the one to fix things. He'll fix those things that we don't even see. We don't even recognize. Because sometimes those are the things that hit us and they shake our foundation of faith because you think, man, I'm, I'm being so faithful. I'm attending worship. I'm here every Sunday, every Wednesday, every time Brother Tim calls for me to go to fellowship or go to this work or go door knock or go do whatever. We need to work in the fellowship. I'm there. I've done all these things, but I still am discontent. I still have doubts. Now, I submit to you this. That's normal for every Christian. We have times when we have faith struggles, and we're not going to feel as close to God. But the Bible says God is greater than our hearts. Recognize that if you're doing the will of God, you're on the right track. Things are going to work out. But on the other hand, on the other hand, if I feel that discontent, There may be something that's a struggle there that I just don't recognize. It may be a part, a problem, a struggle in my life that I just haven't let go of. And that's where we have to be honest. I saw one of the prayer requests. I don't know who it is, but I thought it's a beautiful thing to come and ask for prayer to let go of my anger. That's something nobody sees. You can shake my hand. You can see me smile. You don't know I'm angry on the inside. You know why? Because we're so good at hiding it. So good at covering it up. But you can't hide it from God. You just can't. And it's there. And it's just like that low-level bubbling. Right? Eventually, it just boils over. And it's not going to usually guide us towards something more righteous. It's usually harmful. We're usually going to act impulsively. We're going to respond, not thinking about. Remember what David said? That word have I hit in my heart that I might not. I'm thinking about it. But if the word is not there to control my thoughts, then I'm going to act out. Sometimes the advocacy of prayer is not about I did prayer so well, right? This is not about I said the right words. This is not about I was in the right place or position. I didn't prostrate myself. This is about where are you in your relationship and communication with God. And only you know that. That's what makes it so sobering. But now is the time you can make it right. You can be in that right relationship as we've gathered together to worship God. We've offered our worship to him. We've pondered these thoughts where the condition of ourselves are. 
our body, our soul, and our spirit. And God is just asking you to make a, take an honest, thoughtful, thorough look at your heart. Where are you in your prayer? I submit to you sometimes it takes more than starting. I'm going to pray every morning. That's great. And some of you do it. I commend you. But I do want you to understand this. Sometimes for me, that prayer in the morning is not enough. I still really haven't communicated. I haven't got to what's going on. And sometimes I have to pray morning and night and noon and evening and then again some more. And it does get there. But it takes that challenge to say, if my relationship to God in prayer is not as effective as I know it can be, whose responsibility is to change it? That's me. God's always listening. Now, how many requests have you sent up in the last 24 hours? Don't raise your hand. But you know how many. He wants to hear from you from a genuine place. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, you as our heavenly father, the one who guides us with wisdom and with such awesome power, to you be all the glory and honor. You are the alpha and the omega, the true amen. And we're so thankful for the privilege of being called your children. We're privileged to be together at this very moment. We're grateful that we can be together. And there's no health danger. There's no violent danger. We trust one another because we know that we look to one another with the attitude of Christ. We're looking to one another as souls. And we see deeper than just a surface. We see deeper than men and women. We see deeper than age and race. We see the heart. And we're so thankful, Father, that that's possible because we love you more than we love ourselves. Help us, Lord, to be effective in our prayer. Let us have that communication with you, Lord, that is genuine and pure, that cuts through any noise that this world consumes us with. As we bow ourselves, as we pour out our heart to you, help us to do that more effectively, more honestly and genuinely. Lord, we struggle. We struggle with approaching you when we're hurting. We struggle with approaching you when we've sinned and we need to repent. Help us in those times to that much more cling to you and pour out our hearts to you in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your mercy and grace, for you truly do lift us up. You do clean up our hearts with the beauty of your love and, and the mercy with which you've given your son that our sins can be washed away and that they can be continually cleansed with that pure and precious blood of Christ. Thank you, Father, because this time spent in study has instilled in us an inspiration and a commitment to be more devoted to you in our prayers. To not go through the motions, but to be genuine. To know that you hear us, but also to commit our lives, that we live in such a way that our prayers are not hindered. That we understand that you've given us the freedom from sin. We're no longer in bondage to it. That through Christ we are truly forgiven. And so we're responsible to live in accordance with the walk of Christ. Help us, Father. Keep us from the evil one because we know Satan is always busy, always trying to tempt and discourage us, and so help us to resist genuinely. We desire to resist temptation and be faithful and righteous and pleasing in your sight. So give us the strength. And Lord, help also in forgiving us because we fall short of that. We so much want to be pure but there are times that we openly and headlong give in to temptation. Help us to resist it in accordance with your word. Help us to have this attitude, to know your love, to know in this very moment you've come down, you've drawn, as it were, nigh to us as we draw nigh to you. In the most humble and pure way, we ask for your blessings and mercy. And we're so thankful in Jesus' name and amen. Tonight, as is the occasion, maybe there's something that you've been struggling with, some sin, 
Maybe there's something that you have not repented of, and it's only between you and God. You can repent of that right where you are. But if you need prayer, come forward. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. And if you need assistance in obeying the gospel, we'll certainly do that as we stay and as we sing.